Okay, take it away. Okay. Well, welcome to our presentation today on Hugel culture. Um, before I get started, um, whoops, wait a minute. Okay, you know what? I need to go back to the very start of this one. I messed up here. That's okay, no problem. Oh, and then D, um, if we're going to rename people um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. Okay, no problem. Whoops, now I can't get out of here. Hang on. Okay. That's right. Okay, no problem. It's Sunday. This should be, we got to, we got to relax. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's all enjoyable and um, we're looking forward to it. And that's why we have editing software. So anytime uh, you okay. start, then we'll just, I'll, I'll take it from there. Okay. Sure. And when I pulled it up, I realized right off the bat, I misspelled it. So I had to go back in and change it. And that's why I was on a different screen. There you um, go. I got you. Okay. But anyway, welcome to our presentation on Hugel culture this morning. Um, it was really fun researching this. I've been involved a bit um, up north on the farm, they decided to do a Hugel culture mound, and I was able to participate in that. And then also over on Highland Giving Garden has a Hugel culture mound. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, just a couple really quick housekeeping rules. This presentation is being recorded. Um, you can ask questions as we go in the chat, or I will check in with you periodically and see if there are any questions. Um, we do ask that you turn off your cameras to save bandwidth and keep your mic on mute unless you're actually speaking. And then if you'd like a PDF of the presentation, you can go to our website um, as we're showing on the right. And there's a section called Recent Presentations. You can click on that and it'll pull that up so you can view it again. Um, you may want to do that or do some screenshots. There's a lot of information in this presentation. Also, we'll be dropping resources into the chat box. So if you'd like to save that, um, just open the chat box. There are three dots on the right-hand side. You can click that and then click Save Chat. We are the Master Gardener problem, or program, sorry, <laughs> of San Bernardino County part of the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division of the University of California. We are not campus specific. This is just a statewide program. And we do use trained volunteers to help educate the public by sharing peer reviewed research done by the University of California and other universities um, and reliable sources on a wide variety of topics, including growing food, sustainable landscaping, and better living through gardening. We have some sister programs through UCANR and the University of California Cooperative Extension. And those include FNEP, which is the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, the 4-H program that you may be familiar with, Master Food Preservers, which we work with um, on a regular basis, and they'll be doing a presentation a bit later on this morning. And then also academic advisors, natural resources, horticulture, dairy, and urban agriculture.
We're fortunate to have two STEAM libraries in our area. One is in Yukaipa, the other is in Montclair. Unfortunately, right now they're both closed due to COVID restrictions, but we're hoping to reopen them again fairly soon. And we will keep you updated with our newsletter, so be sure to sign up for that. We also offer monthly seed saving classes on a variety of topics. So we can teach you how to save your own seeds from plants you've successfully grown in your own yard. We will be following up this presentation with an email survey. And we do ask that you take a few minutes and fill that out for us. Um, it gives us good feedback information as to what types of presentations you want to see us do. Um, and it also helps us with our relationship with UCANR and funding. So we really do appreciate your feedback. I do need to take a few minutes to go over these really important public service announcements. I do want to remind you that you are watching the Hugel Culture presentation. We're just taking a little detour for a few minutes. And we want to make you aware of a problem that we're having here in San Bernardino, Riverside, Orange, and LA counties. Um, with a little bug called the Asian citrus psyllid. You can see his picture on the left. He is smaller than a grain of rice. And he carries a disease called HLB um, that is fatal to all citrus trees. So whether you have orange, lemon, lime, uh, mandarins, clementines, tangerines, um, kumquats, any type of citrus is susceptible to this disease. And unfortunately, there is no treatment available. It's being researched, but as yet, there is nothing. So it's very important that you identify uh, the early stages of this disease so that you can contact the proper authorities and have the disease pre-removed. Um, as you'll see in the early stages, the leaves look very mottled and then the fruits themselves end up being mottled as well. They're two-toned, misshapen, and the fruit itself, the in, when you open it, the inside's misshapen and sometimes an odd color. And it just doesn't have the smell that you would expect from that tree. Um, it's not, um, it won't harm you to eat the diseased citrus, but they're not very flavorful. And as the disease progresses, it ends up smelling, tasting a little bit like turpentine. And do keep in mind that this is the disease that really wiped out backyard citrus in the state of Florida. And we really don't want to see that happen here in California. Um, this is just a real quick comparison. There is a citrus leaf miner who does cosmetic damage to your citrus leaves. And you can see what that looks like on the left. It's a bit different than the HLB symptoms that you see on the right. And this is an updated map showing the quarantine areas. You can go to cdfa.ca.gov and they update that periodically. You can help stop the spread of citrus screening or HLB in a couple ways. And I know with the holidays coming up, people are eager to share their citrus and use the citrus and leaves and their floral displays 
and Reese, and we really recommend you not do that. So please, when you're sharing citrus, you can share the fruit, but do not share the stems and leaves where those little bugs like to hide. Um, also, do not share cuttings from your trees because again, they do hide and they may not be visible to the naked eye. But sharing those cuttings and grafting to a healthy tree will end up infecting a healthy tree. And then also keep ants out of your trees. Um, they tend to protect the Asian citrus psyllid bugs because they feed on the excrements, the nectar that those bugs leave behind. So you can help break the cycle by keeping the ants out of your trees, either um, usually cutting them off at the pass and down at the bottom, preventing them from crawling up the tree is the best way to do that. And you can get more information on Asian citrus psyllid and HLB by going to the ucanr.edu website. And that will give you a lot of information in way more depth than we've gone into today. And just another quick um, pest issue, the black big fly has been spotted in Ventura County and it's making its way down here. So be aware of that if you do have fig trees, um, you can see what the fig itself looks like once it's been infected and the different life stages of the fig fly. So I appreciate your patience and we'd like to return to our regularly scheduled presentation on hugel culture. So we'll discuss what hugel culture is, um, how it works in the benefits, um, how to select a site, how to construct it, what you might consider planting, and then maintenance and pest control. To begin with, hugel culture is a system or a technique that's actually been work, used in um, Europe for centuries, some sources say it's actually been in use for over a thousand years. Um, it gained popularity in the 60s and 70s, and there were some German horticulturists who actually coined the phrase, and that roughly translates to mound culture or hill culture. But it is the technique of use, constructing raised beds or mounds using available decaying wood debris and compostable materials in an attempt to recreate the forest floor decomposition. Some of the benefits of hogel culture, and I do warn you that this is mostly anecdotal. There have been very few um, studies done on the effectiveness of hugel culture. Um, I only saw two of them and they, they really didn't give more information than what I found anecdotally. Um, but the nice thing about hugel culture is that you're using your yard debris so it is a great way to construct low cost raised beds. And because of the slope of the hugel culture mound, you actually end up having more surface space for planting than if you planted a flat bed. Um, it also, uh, because of the various elevations and the shade created on one side, it creates several mul uh, microclimates just in that one structure. Um, as these materials that you're using to construct it decompose, it increases soil fertility, 
and you may find that you don't really need to apply fertilizer. And then also the logs and branches you use at the base do retain water and then release that back into the mound as the situation warrants. So it increases water retention, so it reduces your need to water. And with the decaying materials, it encourages healthy microbe growth. The soil remains loose and well aerated. Decomposing materials generate and retain heat, which is beneficial in extending your growing season. Um, so you can find that you actually might be able to plant two to three weeks earlier in the growing season and your growing season will extend another two to three weeks on the other end because the soil is so warm. It's a great way of recycling your yard debris and most mounds depending on what materials you use, will last eight to 10 years. And using hardwoods as the base can actually last up to 20 or 30 years. So the first thing you want to do is select a site. And a lot of that will depend on how large you want to make your mound. Um, some are as small as four by four. The one we had up at the farm was about four by 80. It was massive. Um, you do want to keep it about at least 30 feet away from wooden structures. Um, there are reports that the wood does attract termites. But in another report I read, it said they're really not that attracted to the decaying wood at the base of the hugel culture. They prefer standing trees. Um, so just to be on the safe side, I'd say go ahead and keep it away from your house or any wooden structures on your property. You also want to select an area that can remain undisturbed for 20 to 30 years, since that's how long this is going to last. You want an area that provides adequate sunlight, has proximity to water. Um, and you can also, if you're familiar with swales and berms, to divert or capture rainwater runoff. Hugel culture mounds are an excellent way to do that. Um, so keep that in mind. The materials you're going to use to construct your hugel culture would be a variety of hard and soft woods. And for the most part, that can be um, whatever you've pruned from the trees on your property. They do suggest that you avoid black locust, black walnut, and redwood. Um, there are some trees that um, do become a bit toxic as they decompose. And then also, some of the hardwoods do take forever to decompose, which is why they recommend you avoid redwoods but some of the softer fir trees are fine to use um, along with the one, the fruit tree clippings. Um, oak is another one that takes a bit longer to decompose, but poplar, maple, willow, pine all decompose um, a bit more quickly. You'll also want to use twigs, small branches and wood chips. Um, if you have it available, you can use straw and grass clippings, dead leaves, and then overturned sod. If you are considering removing some of your lawn to place the native plants or other 
vegetation, this is an excellent use for the sod. Just go ahead and remove it and you can place it upside down on top of your hugel culture mount. You'll also be using some garden soil and compost. So to construct your hugel culture, dig a trough or a furrow. Um, that does help give some stability um, and it encourages the microbes and worms in the soil to come up and work on the wood and other debris that you're using for your mound. So you'll start by layering hardwoods and then on top of that, put your soft woods. The next layer is going to be twigs and sticks and wood chips. And then cover that with dead leaves and or straw if you have it available. Um, covered with a layer of mature compost. Um, and that probably about four inches is adequate on that. And then add sod or another four to six inches of soil and then top it with mulch. Do I have any questions on what we've covered so far? Nothing yet. If anybody wants to unmute themselves, uh, feel free, but this is so interesting. I'm like taking notes here. <laughs> I do a I lot have... of screenshots. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, does it have to be uh, that deep or can you just make it like 12 inches or? Um... Not at all. And that's the wonderful thing about Hugo Culture Mounds very flexible. It's just using what you have on your property, what you're comfortable with. Um, the only reason that they mention digging that trough is just to give the microbes and worms a head start, but it's not necessary. You can go ahead and just start your mound on flat ground that's been cleared of other things. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Anything else? Okay, let's move on. Um, here's an example of a Hugel culture mound. Um, and again, showing the hardwood at the bottom with smaller twigs on the next layer. Um, this is showing turf with the grass face down if you're using sod. Um, followed by the humus or compost. And as it grows, the one on the right is what it ends up looking like. Um, I'm, I'll just warn you, as it decomposes, it does shrink a little bit. So you'll end up with a tall mound and over the years, it gets a little shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, but also, um, as the years go by, the nutrients that are added to the soil become stronger and richer. So even though you're losing surface, you're getting a much richer soil. Um, when you're putting it together, do keep in mind the position of the sun and the wind direction. And here are a couple design variations. As you can see, there's just a huge variety. The one on the left is a very tall mound um, and they have basically doubled their surface planting area because of the height. Um, the one on the right is a bit shorter and um, looks like it may have been dug a little bit deeper to begin with. The two on this page are using keyhole gardens, which is another concept, um, but these are great 
what you do is a semicircle with a path in the middle, and that gives you easy access to your garden from all sides, um, and it's very attractive. You can see the way that was constructed on the right. Um, and often what people do is that their compost bin in the center of the key hole garden, and that again would continue to bring nutrients into your soil. Some more design variations. Um, again, this is a very tall one, and that has probably tripled your planting area on the right-hand side. Because of the different microclimates on your hugel culture, you can grow a huge variety of plants. Um, this shows the Mediterranean herbs being planted on the top where they get the most sun. And then peppers, beans, tomatoes, carrots, all requiring a lot of sun would be on the west or south side. Whereas the more cool weather vegetables can go on your eastern north side. Um, so broccoli, peas, salad greens, potatoes would all thrive in the bit of shade created by your hugel culture. So anything that you would grow in your raised bed can definitely go in your hugel culture. And depending on whether they need full sun, partial sun or shade, that would dictate where you place it on your structure. Um, one of the wonderful things about hugel culture maintenance is um, you'll want to weed it just so that your plants aren't competing for nutrients. And then, especially the first year, you do want to keep it watered. Um, but over time, you'll find that you need to water it less and less because of the water that's absorbed and re released by the decomposing materials. So weed and water, and that is pretty much it. Most of the work goes into constructing it to begin with, and then you just let it do its thing. Um, so I do have some illustrations. The one on the left shows what it looks like initially and how it degrades or decomposes over time. Um, again, on the right-hand side, showing you how to optimize or layer the different materials in your hugel culture mount. For pest control, it really depends on what you plant. So um, unfortunately, the plants are not immune from pests in your hugel culture mount. Um, so you may end up with some vertebrates, um, especially the little gophers that like popping up. Um, so I'd recommend lining your bed with mesh or hardware cloth. Uh, and then invertebrates definitely encourage beneficial insects. Um, if you do need to get rid of them, start with a water spray just to knock them off your plant or hand pick them to get rid of them, or use the least toxic um, insecticidal soap. And for disease, I would recommend that you identify the disease and look it up on UCANR IPM. Um, treat the disease, treat the bug, not the entire mound. Um, because whatever you do, especially with insecticidal sprays, things that kill the pests that you're concerned with are also going to kill bees and other beneficial insects. So do be careful not to spray while the plants are in bloom or the bees are active.
And here I have some resources for you if you'd like to check them out. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm, I'm wondering, I wonder with that, that picture of that lady, I mean, I saw picture of that illustration of the lady with that very tall mound. I wonder yeah. if that is a really short, I mean, obviously it's an illustration and just sort of, but I wonder if you could get a mound that could be four, four feet tall or three and a half feet tall. Do you think that's a possibility? I mean, obviously, uh, I guess any scale, but I wonder how practical, I guess you would have to definitely have that solid structural wood inside, huh? Definitely, definitely. It depends on how you structure it. I would personally be a bit reluctant to build it that tall because things don't decompose evenly and you're going to see some shift. It might end up um, breaking away at some point. So I, I would really, pre I personally would keep it fairly flat on the top rather than trying to bring it to a point. And I, I would keep it about four feet, realistically. Um, most of the ones that I've seen do have about six inches to one foot um, base at the bottom where they've dug in. And then the top part of it is about three feet tall, four feet tall. That makes sense. Very good. Yeah, I agree with that. That sounds good. Does anybody yeah. else have any um, other questions? Um, and then in just a moment, I'll stop the recording. But if anybody had any questions, um, and we'll share these resources in the chat. Great presentation. OK. I did want to mention, too, that these are great for adaptive gardening. Um, just make sure you have wide enough paths. But because they are taller, there's easy access for people um, with varying ability levels. That is a really good point. I didn't even think about that. Really great point. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Sky. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and check out our other presentations on our YouTube channel. OK.